Hello and welcome to Fog Machine. I am your host, Darren Robbins. Today we're going to talk about opening acts. Back when I was uh, just starting out in the mid-80s, my band wanted to, you know, play some gigs around the nearest big town, which in our case was South Bend, Indiana. <sighs> One of the uh, production companies was a company by the name of Sunshine Promotions, I believe. They put on all the concerts that came to the Notre Dame ACC and Moore Civic Auditorium, venues like that. They were the big deal. And uh, so, naturally, I sent a tape to them, kept pestering them on the phone. Hey, man, have you guys listened to my tape? Can you give us a show? And then one day, I'm sitting at home, it's Friday night, my girlfriend has just come over, we're just about ready to start feeling each other up, when the phone rings. My mom answers it, and uh, she comes to the top of the stairs and yells down, Hey, it's for you! So then I put my pants back on, I trudge up the stairs, I pick up the phone, and I say, Yes? Hey, are you guys uh, available to open for Stevie Ray Vaughan tonight? I'm like, what the fuck? Who is this? This is Pete from Sunshine Promotions. The band that we had booked to open for Stevie Ray is unable to make the show. Their van broke down driving from Indianapolis to South Bend. Can you guys do the show? Holy shit, this is the break that I have been waiting for since the band started. I immediately say, yes, we're going to do the gig. And then I hang up the phone and I call my other two bandmates. Unfortunately, those motherfuckers are gone for the night, each off to South Bend with their buddies and their girlfriends, partying, eating at Long John Silver's and shit like that, playing putt-putt golf. And in doing so, missing the biggest opportunity of our careers. Keep in mind that this was before fucking cell phones. This is 1985, you know, only fucking Crockett and Tubbs had cell phones or Hollywood agents, you know. You didn't see housekeepers waiting for a bus with a cell phone glued to their head. Not back then you didn't. So I had to call putt-putt courses and restaurants and any other place that I could think of that they might be hanging out and tell the people on the phone, dudes, please help me out. There are, <laughs> there are guys in your establishment who have the opportunity to open for Stevie Ray Vaughan. Can you see if they are there? So I heard over the loudspeakers at the putt-putt course, uh, such and such, your band is opening for Stevie Ray Vaughan. Get your ass home, load up your equipment, and come back to South Bend as soon as you fucking can. Unfortunately, he wasn't there. I still don't know where he was. All I know is that it was the next morning before either one of my bandmates finally called me back and said, Hey, I saw, I heard that we had an opportunity to... Oh, yeah, you heard... You heard you had an opportunity? You goddamn motherfuckers. I was here, ready to fucking rock and roll. You guys are out fucking having goddamn chicken planks. Fuck that nonsense. As you can tell, I'm a little bit upset about it to this day. And that is because, back then, a gig like that would have put us on the motherfucking map. I mean... No other local band had opened for Stevie Ray Vaughan. We would have had a very big feather in our cap. Even though we weren't exactly a blues band. It just didn't fucking matter. Just getting in front of people or, or being given that legitimacy that you got from Sunshine Promotions actually saying, hey, you know, I think you are good enough to open a major show. And so, you know, it would have been nice if my two fellow bandmates had been home. 
or that the cell phone technology had been more advanced at the time and everybody had one because then all I would have had to do is send them each a text and we would have played the show. Simple as that. So I was fucked not only by my bandmates but by technology. And yes, I'm still mad about it. That's because opening act was a, a, a prestigious thing back then, you know? I mean, it was something that wasn't just thrown around. Like, hey, let's just get a bunch of fucking losers to open the show. No. Bands back then took opening acts seriously. If you were a headliner, for example, and you were going out on a national tour, you were excited about being able to pick your own opening acts, you know? Not only could you pick your uh, friends or, you know, bands that were also on the roster of your manager or whatever, but you could pick bands that you actually liked, you know, that were heroes of yours that could benefit from the leg up. I'm thinking of, you know, R.E.M. having the DBs open for them or something, you know? When you can do something like that, that's that's paying it forward and, and also, you know, paying tribute to the, your heroes while there's still an opportunity to help them out. So, you know, the whole opening act thing was a big deal, and to this day I still think that it is a big deal, but I do think that some bands place a little bit too much importance on, you know, opening for who and who and this or that, you know, when they could be doing something a little more constructive. I mean, it's kind of like, how long do you, you know, keep opening for the Jimmy Eat worlds of the, uh, the rock world when, you know, you could be, you know, doing your own thing. Maybe not playing to as many people, but you would be putting on your own shows instead of doing the whole opening act thing. Because I will tell you that it is tough to be an opening act. And I will tell you about some of my experiences after this fog break. Oh, yeah. Time to get me some coffee in my gullet. Oh, yes. By the way, Darren Robbins here. Welcome to Fog Machine. I apologize for the lack of production values. I'm in my 50s, you know? I don't, I don't walk around going, Hey, man, I'm going to edit this in Premiere Pro and just slap it up on the internet and it'll look like a fucking 4K 60 frames per second masterpiece. I'm lucky to be able to roll tape and, you know, I got some lights and a fog machine going and my camera works. All that shit is happening at the same time. That, in my world, is a fucking miracle. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm just enjoying my coffee while it's hot adjacent. I can't tell you how many times I get, like, one sip of coffee and it's perfect, you know? perfect temperature. You've got the, the perfect mix of creamer and Arabica beans and you're just in fucking heaven and then you get into whatever you're doing and by the time you think of taking a second sip, it's fucking stone cold. Hey everybody, Darren Robbins here. Welcome back to Fog machine. So as we were uh, saying, uh, opening act used to be a big deal. I mean, it was kind of a you know a feather in your cap if you got to open for uh, I don't know Ronnie Montrose or Head East or who the fuck. I could give a shit. I mean, I would have opened for anybody anywhere. I didn't even have to hear of you. Many a times we were offered slots of Hey, have you heard of? Uh, Jimmy's Chicken Shack? Fuck no, but yes, we'll take the gig. And sometimes we would open for bands that technically nobody, you know, in our circle had heard of. But when we got to the gig, we were like, holy shit, this place is sold out. <laughs> this band actually has a following and we've never even fucking heard of them. I remember when I was playing the uh, Chicago scene around 2008 or so with uh, Mike and Ted from Material Issue. 
we actually opened for a band called the Clarks, and I had kind of an inkling that they had a following, so I contacted the Beat Kitchen, where the gig was being held, and I said, hey, have you guys got an opener for that show? We'd love to do it. And they said, oh, great, you know, we haven't booked anybody for that, so you're doing us a favor. And I said, well, that's what I love to do. And they said, uh, can you do it for a hundred bucks? Of course I can. Huh. So we get there, and already people are like lining up, you know, and they're in, in the bar area, and then they're just waiting to get into that music room. And uh, my bandmates are looking at me like, holy shit, who the fuck are the Clarks? And I mean, everybody there knew all the fucking words to all the Clark songs, had all the albums, were buying up t-shirts left and right. It was an amazing thing to behold. And it taught me a lesson in that, you know, there is no shame in being a band that hardly anybody's heard of, like the Clarks, if you have a devoted following uh, that will follow you anywhere. Because, I mean, this place, Beat Kitchen, uh, it's kind of, you know, in a weird part of Chicago. You know, it used to be uh, right in the fucking heart of the action back when uh, the, uh, the actually, the, the owner's previous bar was Orphans, and that was right on Lincoln Avenue, right across from the Wax Tracks. Prime area. Holy shit. But the Beat Kitchen was further west and north. And like I said, in kind of a weird neighborhood. So it was kind of hard to get people out there. You know, there's people that would go see you if you played the Metro, but they wouldn't go see you if you played the Beat Kitchen. But on this particular case, oh my God, people came out of the woodwork. And they were there to see us. Meaning that they were there in the room when we played. We didn't play to an empty room. That place was already packed, and about halfway through our show, it was twice as packed as it was when we began. And, you know, if you're delusional, like I am, you get to fool yourself into thinking that you're playing to your own audience. It's bullshit. But it's a psychological thing that you have to do. I mean, you have to get joy wherever you can. And if you want to fool yourself into thinking that all these people are there to see you, knock yourself out. But, uh, you know, we went ahead, did our little 45 minutes, got our money, and uh, then we just kind of sat back and watched a real band do their thing. And it was quite impressive. And to this day, I have a lot of respect for bands like the Clarks, for just going out, doing their thing, playing to a crowd that is not there because they're signed to a major label. I think they may have been at one point. And that's the one thing that all of these bands do seem to have, is they have a period of being on a major label, and that gives them the legitimacy to then go out on their own, you know, and stay indie. A band like Not A Surf, for example. Even though hardly anybody remembers them being on Elektra, they were. And they did have a hit on MTV for a time before they turned into Critical Darlings and were working with the same label as Death Cap for Cutie. So, more about being an opening act. Uh, the great thing about being an opening act is that sound is done for you. There's a sound guy that's going to do your set if you don't have your own guy. I'll have to pardon my cat. Give it a rest. Where the fuck were we? I, I do we even know any more fucking cats? I swear to God. See if we get this fog machine. Yeah, hey, yeah, I know. Fog machine, Darren Robbins, whatever. What the fuck were we even talking about? Fuck it at this point. Fuck it. Episode over. <laughs>